All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another usual Sunday talk within the Nine Sided Circle. I'm one of your two hosts, Noor Kyle. And I am the other one of your two hosts, Mushtaq Ali. Yeah, so thank you for joining us, whether you're joining us live, we got a bunch of cool people here, or you're joining us on the replay on YouTube. Thank you, thank you, thank you for showing up. It feels really good to have you here. So before we get into our fun topic this evening, we got to do our YouTube spiel. Take it away, Mushtaq. Yeah. All right. So if you are watching us on YouTube, welcome. If this is your first time, you are doubly welcome. We are happy to have you. Um, we would really love it, whoever you are and whatever you're watching, if you would kindly consider going down and liking our video so that we can get up in the esoteric algorithms of YouTube. Um, that seems to make a big difference. Um, also, if you are not subscribed to us, and surprisingly more people are not subscribed to us than are subscribed to us, and who can figure that? But we would love it if you would consider subscribing to our channel. Um, there are a couple of things going on with that. We don't really care if we have thousands of viewers, but we do care if people are spammed with commercials. And the only way we can begin to control the commercials that um, YouTube puts on our videos is if we can get a thousand subscribers and join their partner program and have some say over what happens with that. Uh, also, the only way that we can do things like mention other channels is if we're in that partners program thing. So we're striving to do that. This is our way of sticking it to the man and not letting idiots uh, spam our, our watchers with weird uh, advertisements for things that we do not and cannot support, uh, which Amen is most everything. <laughs> most everything, yeah. There's plenty of weird shit that keeps popping up on our channels that we're not happy about. And there's really nothing we can do about that until we play the game to break the rules. So, so help us stick it to the man by subscribing to this channel. And this week only, if you subscribe to this channel from this video, you will win an amusing prize. You won't even know what that prize is. You won't even know when you get it, but you will get that amusing prize. And when you get that amusing prize, Comment down below and tell us what it is. <laughs> Please do. We're, we're excited to hear about it. All right. So um, do we have any uh, announcements currently? Um, not I don't that I can so. think of. Yeah. OK, so with no further ado, let's get into our topic for this evening, which is idol worship what the hell does that mean what are we talking about that what what are we talking about when we say that and there are a lot of common conceptual conceptualizations about what that means regarding formal religious practice and dogma and such we're going to be touching on that but we're also going to go deeper than that take it away much talk for just to get us rolling. All right. Well, first of all, idol worship is not having a statue of Shiva Nataraj sitting on your mantle. That's not what we're talking about. There are stupid people who think that that's idol worship, and it's not. Idol worship is this whole different thing. Um, so if you have you know, pictures of saints or uh, various aspects of the one reality manifesting as Krishna or Shiva or Lakshmi or whatever, or whatever you got, that ain't it. Or even like a totem, right? You know, that kind of Yeah, thing. even that. So what is idol worship really and why is it not good for you? I'm glad you asked. So to understand this, at least from our point of view, we have to look at the Arabic word for an idol. 
and that is Mahbud. Um, and it comes from an interesting root. All Arabic words come from these three letter roots. And the root that this word comes from is Abd, which is Ein Be Dal, if for those of you who want to look it up in Arabic. And that word means slave or servant. It can also, strangely enough, mean making a roadway that people can pass through. Um, and then ma'bud comes from that word. And um, it has some interesting connotations because it can mean idle. Uh, but under a slightly different usage, it means beloved. So think about that for a second. Idle, beloved. Um, another word, another meaning for abd is to serve or to worship. Uh, and that goes back to the meaning of slave. Um, and we talk about a specific kind of idol. In, in Arabic, we say al-mabud an-nafs, the idols of the ego. And that is what we are not going to worship, ideally, though most of us end up doing that, at least at some point of our, in our lives. So my analogy for, all, for this has always been a teenage boy. Now, some of you have never been teenage boys, but some of you will remember this. You remember your first crush when you were a boy? You remember how you were fixated on that person? How uh, they were never out of your mind? How you were completely focused on them? Uh, you would sit and that's what you would think about. You would be watching TV and thinking about uh, this person. In my case, it was a girl named Kathy. I thought about her all the time. You know, to this day, I can, I can still pull up an image of her as a 14-year-old girl. Um, and there was probably for close to a year, never a moment where she wasn't somewhere in my mind, either in my consciousness or just below the level of my consciousness. She was an idol in the sense of what we're talking about here. And the choices that I made as that 13 or 14 year old boy were all about how I could obtain <coughs> my desire, which was to worship at the feet of my idol, or at least get her to go out with me. Um, I laugh because I also had a girl in my life that I felt the same way about from around the ages of 16 to 19. And it's true. It's obsessive. It, it, all of your energy and focus goes to the, you know, this craving, desire, longing for this person as we imagine them to be. And that can be a very powerful thing, but, you know, it took me away from school. It took me away from my friendships. It definitely enhanced the tumultuous teenage years in my household because my focus was so pinpointedly aimed at this person who I did deeply care about but was also trapped in this idolizing fantasy worship situation as well. Yeah, 
And the thing about this is that you make choices in your life around the effect of this idol. You know, I would literally choose to walk an extra quarter mile at school so I would go back past her homeroom. Things like that. Um, the most interesting thing was that she and I ended up becoming really good friends and have been good friends for years and years and years. Um, and it turns out she was nothing like I thought she was. She was much cooler, actually, which is <laughs> nice when it works out that way. But um, during this phase of my life, I never really saw her. I didn't see who she was. All I saw was the idol that I was worshiping. Mm -hmm. So if you were ever a 13-year-old boy, you can probably relate to this. Uh, from what Noor has said, I think that women can experience something quite similar. I would not be surprised. Um, but the thing is, we have a bunch of these things and we don't notice. You know, the idol can be a person, it can be a place, it can be a position, it can be any of these things. But what it is, is a construct in your head that you project on the world and then act as if it's real. Does that make sense? Do you all understand what I'm talking about? Help me out here. Otherwise, I'm going to go wandering off in some weird direction talking about my teenage years and you're going to be like massively bored. Well, I think I understand it, but I'm wondering whether it can be less obsessive, but still a hazard. Um, of course. Unless you are a 13 year old boy who has more hormones than blood in his system, you know. I but yes, have a little it, list it, here. less obsessive, but it, it is that same sort of thing. Did, you said something, Nancy, and I didn't catch it. What was well, then I have a little list here. A little list here, do you? Yeah, yeah. Nations. Nations make very handy idols. Oh, yes. And kind of amusingly, so do religions. Mm -hmm. Yep. I suspect that health can become an idol. And I was thinking that one's conception of oneself can be an idol. Yes. Yeah, those are all uh, definitely big potential idols, depending on the person and how they've constructed these things for themselves, what kind of relationship did they build up with that construct, all of that stuff. So that gets us into the question that Mustakim has. Why do we have this obsession with the idol? Where does it come from? It comes from us making something and then pretending it's real. It's like uh, the classic example of this is the Israelites wandering in the desert and Moses goes off to climb Mount Sinai and hang out with God and, and get laws and stuff. And they get freaked out. So they, they collect up all of their jewelry, melt it down and make a golden calf and worship it. Now, why the hell would they do that? That's not even like any kind of a deity that anybody's heard of. But they did it. It is a construct of our mind to try and deal with something that we have no other way of dealing with that we know of. So do you think that was a response to otherwise very overwhelming feelings and existential yeah. insecurity? And that yeah, kind of thing? That, was a, that was a child's response. The Israelites mm -hmm. at that time were children. They were not mature. 
Moses was the father figure. He splits. Aaron's not the father figure, just Moses. So everybody throws a tantrum and they try and create their own internal father figure, which we all do. Did you know that you probably have an internal father figure? Might look like your father, might look like somebody else. But it will be inside of you somewhere. If we dig around, we find it. And you will sometimes project it out onto the world and onto other people. This happens in relationships all the time. When two people get together, it's actually usually at least four people. There is you, your partner, your image of who you think your partner is, and their image of who they think you are. And it can be, when you understand this and you see it happening, it can be a little terrifying. I, I remember the, the day I first understood this, I was hanging out with this girl and I realized that she was projecting onto me what she wanted to see that had nothing to do with me. Not even remotely having anything to do with me. But it was all there and was like, she is attempting to force me into this mold because it suits her, her inner image. And this is idol worship. This is what idol worship is. When you take the inner image of the other and try and force the people in your life to be that, whether they are or not, you are worshiping idols. You didn't realize this was going to be about relationships, did you? You thought it was going to be about statues. Like the scary statue I put on the, the graphic for this talk. Which is an Aztec goddess, by the way. So what are some other examples? Yeah, Jonathan, I see you unmuted. Why don't we talk to you yeah. first? So to me, it sounds like what you're saying is an idol is something we place enormous value on and we imagine that it's going to be extremely beneficial to us. Yet there's no actual evidence for this. Uh, for example, Western medicine could be that for many people. I believe that Western medicine is going to take care of my health. It's going to prevent me from aging and maybe I can live forever. Some people might think that. Some people might think that about Chinese medicine. It's a matter Probably. of not what is, but what you do with it. Um, you know, talking about that girl when I was 13, if you would have asked me, I would have told you that if she and I could get together, it would be the most perfect thing in the world. We would be totally happy. We would have been in bliss for the rest of our lives. And a hundred years from that day, we would still be together and we would still be happy. And she would still look just like she did today. Um, and that was a complete and utter fantasy. Like I said, she was a much more interesting person than I thought she was. Um, and though we became really, really, really good friends, um, I realized that as a romantic relationship, we were not actually even compatible. She wanted different things than I did. Fascinating. Yeah. Mm. But... Yeah, you know, that was one of the things where the outcome was e turned out to be even better than the fantasy.
So I don't know if we answered your question, Jonathan, or if we just rambled on. Well, I was really just giving another example. Okay. Unmute your mic. Arg. Okay. Um, yeah, I do think first loves can be a huge one, a very powerful one, and one that I think many of us can relate to. And Jonathan, you bring up a good one when it comes to, you know, what can we expect from various forms of healthcare and what they can provide for us, given whatever complicated real life circumstances we may have and whatever boundaries there may still be in whatever field of medicine we're talking about. I mean, the fantasy of living forever right now has certainly been proven time and time again to be beyond the edge of what's possible at this moment. So. Yeah, unless you are some heavy duty saint somewhere uh, <laughs> and ain't none of us that good. Well, yeah, but I mean, there's no pill you can take that's gonna make it all okay right now. Um, yeah, we talked uh, about- Yeah, the point I was wanted to really <laughs> cover was it's it's imaginary mm -hmm. what one yes. allows oneself to fall in to the trap of imagining the, these wonderful benefits and mm -hmm. so you don't take responsibility that's a good point too yeah yep and we also touched on when Mushtaq and I were prepping we talked about like dream careers dream homes fantasies of fame and fortune, um, things like that as well. Things that you'll, you don't care if you hurt yourself, you hurt others, you're going for that vision regardless, or you're holding on to that fantasy regardless. Yeah, so that dream home is a good example. My dream home is a single story uh, Santa Fe style adobe uh, with a tile roof and an adobe wall around the acre or so land on it and uh, to me that's a perfect home now it could become an idol if I thought that I had to have it and that's a thin line sometimes because of all of the kinds of homes that I would like to live in, that's the one. It is, to me, the most comfortable kind of home. Um, it has all sorts of emotional value to it, all of this kind of stuff. Um, but it has not risen to the level of an idol because I don't pursue it uh, actually at all. It's just, I know that that's my perfect idea of a home. So it sounds like you're talking about a quality of attachment to yes. a idea, to a, a relationship. Like people can have that attachment to marriage where they pour all of that onto a particular person. And then two years down the track, they go, oh, you're just, you're not, the person I wanted to be married to, watch out, Chris. <laughs> it's just one of those things that I think is, is quite common is that what we're going to see uh, in the near future is because interest rates are so low, people have overextended, bought these big houses because they feel that their idol of success, uh, comfort, security, all of these things are wrapped into this big home and then bang the the bubble bursts and your interest rates go up and you can't afford it anymore and there's going to be real big consequences for people not recognizing that their attachment to a particular thing is actually setting them yeah 
it's led to disaster. Yeah, what happens is you make an image in your mind of what it is that you want. Maybe tell yourself a story about that. And then you say, and if I only had this, I would be happy. Mm. We saw this, uh, a great example was the 2016 election, I think it was. Whichever one Bernie was was uh, in the primaries for, right? Yeah, that was the one, yeah. Yeah, and everybody who were, were Bernie supporters had this beautiful image of how great the country would be if only Bernie were president. And he wasn't. And so they were all crushed and they went away. And they led another group with a fantasy of how great the world would be if Trump were president, have their way. And that failed too. And just like the Bernie or bust people are still convinced that Bernie was the, the only real choice, the Trump people are still convinced that Trump is, only, is the only real choice. And reality says something different. So idols take you away, away from the real. And remember, the real is one of the names of God. Yeah, um, Josh, I saw you unmuted. Did you want to share out loud or you want me to just read your post? Just read it. Okay. Um, Josh says, I have my own personality or false personality as my idol, and I keep worshiping it my whole life. And if somebody threw a, threw a stone at my self image, or my idol, I would get hurt. Yep, that's usually the case. I, that makes the very good point of the biggest idol that we have is our own image of ourself. But what, Jayesh, what is that personality of yours? What is it going to do for you? What are you, what are you imagining that it's going to give to you that personality is giving me some kind of satisfaction i am a good person i'm right i'm straightforward i am uh, truthful and i then i keep maintaining this quality and i am in fact i'm in love with all these my belief system and uh, there are buffers within me and i'm not able to see the other side of it many times and then when somebody triggers that point, then uh, I get irritated. So usually I am identified with my own personality or my own uh, image, and I keep worshipping that image for the whole life. I feel like you're saying really good stuff, Jayesh. I want to make sure everybody's hearing you, though. Do you, are you able to um get closer to your microphone or to turn up yeah your and let let me turn on the live transcript too that will yeah work. oh that's right that's important as yeah. well so should i repeat it this is better yes yeah okay so i was saying that uh, i am in um, love with my own self-image and that is my own idol and uh, like my self-image is i am always speaks truth I'm upright, I'm straightforward, uh, I'm a spiritual person, and I love these images. And if somebody uh, triggers uh, among these points, then uh, I get irritated. So that is a, that is a point that I, can, I should learn that uh, all this is my self-image, and I am highly occupied or pre-identified with this uh, idol, my own idol. And it's a turning point for me that uh, the truth is different. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like that draws another, that calls us to draw another fine distinction where, of course, there's value in our life and in our beingness. 
but are we getting attached to the superficial and the image type stuff as opposed to connecting with what is real, what is essence? And all of those things can feel very tender and delicate, especially when we have things come up that point to the real as opposed to bolstering this image that we have of ourselves. So thank you for sharing that. I think we all feel that on some level. And uh, Mustakim says, it seems human default. It seems like a human default to have idols one way or another to serve something. Hmm. What do you think about that, Mushtaq? Hmm. I'm not sure if it's to serve it or to get it to serve you. Mm. If that makes sense. Say more about that. Uh, at least for the idols that I have had in my life, it's all about if I only had this, it would make my life better. Not I would make its life better, mm -hmm. but it would make my life better. If only I had this job, it would make my life better. I get the job, my life is not better, it may be different, it may be the same, but I thought that it would make my life better. I want this person in a relationship with me. I get it, turns out this person is nothing like I thought they were gonna be. Yeah. And this is kind of, you know, the, we all have goals that we set. We all have intentions that we strive towards, but there's a difference between moving towards those things and having this, this grasping covetousness where we think it's the answer to all of our problems and everything is gonna be great as soon as we are able to possess that thing. Yeah. So here, here's the, the thing. I see Jonathan's unmuted. Okay, oh, Jonathan, really lay it okay, on us. Yeah, I had another. I wanted to address that um, that service, so idea of service, and what another one of. I had a little list like Nancy. Mm. So what, another thing on my list is that the entertainments industry yeah what people hope to gain from the entertainment industry is i never have to be bored again in my life i'm going to be entertained i never have to face my loneliness that's uh, definitely a part of it that's a big part of it there's a there's a flip side to that too you know which is the people who are in the entertainment industry and think, oh, if I could only become famous, my life would be good. Mm -hmm. I would be fulfilled. So it's, it's a mess in every direction you can think of. Mm -hmm. Right. And I feel that the pinnacle of technology that it's trying to achieve is the creation of the robot, the android that can replace a person. There's an obsession with, with, with robots. There always has been for, for, for oh, decades. Yeah. And imagine this, I can, I can marry this android. I don't have to deal with its crap. It's gonna treat me well. It's gonna entertain me. In, it, and yeah. it's a servant. It's going to be the perfect slave and servant to me. Yeah. We're not there yet in technology, but the, the, the hope is, boy, could, when are they going to develop the real Android that can, can do all of this? 
Yeah, that's definitely, you know, Westworld, Stepford Wives, all the way back. You, you know, the first movie that that was brought up in was uh, a silent movie called Metropolis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With the hot android babe. How far back does that go? That's 1930s? Like 1920s? 20s, 30s, yeah. Like that, yeah. It was it was before movies with sound, so mm -hmm. it was a while back. Worth watching. It's very, very interesting. But here's the thing. And this is maybe the important thing. Is that your idols are what creates your decisions in the world if you are the slave to them if you are worshiping your idols then the choices that you make are the choices that will serve the idols like i said i would walk out of my way so i could go past this girl's homeroom um, I would make choices so that we might accidentally bump into each other at random places in random times. Um, I would not go and hang out with my friends because I thought, oh, maybe I'll get a phone call. <coughs> and that is the real deadly danger to idols, is that if you are worshiping an idol, if you're worshiping one of the idols of your ego, you will make choices to try and serve that idol rather than to serve you. That sounds so familiar. I mean... <laughs> Well, yeah, you were 13 once. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I was also a late blooming 16 year old. So maybe I went through your 13 year old stuff at 16. Yeah, I was I was precocious. I have yeah, to admit. Yeah. So maybe we are meeting in the middle. But I mean, I grew up in the era of AOL instant messenger and I would just be up late or be on my computer because I wanted to be available when this girl would reach out to me. Or I would be out with friends and I would get a message that she wanted me to be on my computer and I would rush home leaving my friends so that I could go have a conversation with her and devour every crumb of attention she might be willing to, to offer me. I mean, it's just so absurd to think about it now, but we develop these, these ways of prioritizing things that are in actuality very unhealthy for us because they feed this drive to you know be close to this this fantasy that we built up yeah close to an idol mm -hmm. One of the challenges of having your focus on a particular person and then they choose someone else over you and that feeling of initial disappointment uh, that this person can't return your affection and they're focusing it on someone else. For me, it was about how can I actually stay friends with that person in an open-hearted way without condition? That was when I grew up, when I could actually give goodwill towards the person I had focused on, but also onto the person that they've chosen to be with. Uh, that was a mature, maturation point for me. So even if it's a relationship or a thing, if someone says to me, oh, I really like your handbag, and say it's a brand new handbag, I've been saving up for ages for it. If I can in that moment say, would you like it? And honestly, let them have it. I know that's not an idol to me. So being able to let that go in that moment without gapping, without having to think about it, 
that for me is my my sadhana, my hard lesson that I, I step into it, feel the disappointment, and then now open your heart and do something else, something that is more uh, inclusive, not separating. Because I think sometimes if we let an idol go, we can just turn our backs on it or turn back on the relationship. But that's not really helpful. No, and the idol like, is still there. Mm -hmm. It's still there, yeah. yeah. So we haven't really dealt with it. So that being able to stay loving and open for in a relationship-wise, uh, that's a good thing. And also when I look back at particular crushes, I think, thank God I didn't end up with it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, I do think there is there is a certain... You're right. Like this, this growth that happens when you realize mm -hmm. this person is a full human being, and I want to embrace that about them, mm -hmm. and allow you know, enjoy that they are living their lives. Yeah, yeah. I think it's such a great thing, but it also comes down to objects as well. Where yeah, being able to liberate yourself from being enslaved to that idol. Mm -hmm. That is so interesting. What an interesting sensation. You think, okay, I don't need to own that. I don't need to possess that. And it doesn't possess me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's always an object. The idol is always an object. There is no subject subjectivity to an idol. This is why uh, that statue of Shiva is not an idol, because there is a subjectivity behind it. it only, it's only an image to remind you of the subjectivity. It's not an object, if that makes sense. So, Jayash, uh, yeah. Jayash, yeah. Yeah. idols are meant to uh, be, uh, get broken one day. Yes. Not... So, uh, in, in the case of uh, Ramakrishna, uh, he was worshipping Kali uh, and uh, one day the Guru uh, told him that now whenever Kali appears, cut it uh, from your sword. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. And and when idol, idol gets broken, it uh, sometimes induces intense heat or burning inside but then burning can be considered as the tapas yes and with that heat we can get liberated from that uh, uh, false illusion thank you jayesh yeah <sighs> so this this uh this is a good spot to bring in nancy's question she asks yes. how do people pry loose from idols first you have to know that they're there. Mm. Step one, self-observation. What is commanding your attention? Not what catches your attention. What is commanding your attention? If you notice yourself sitting someplace and just imagining something like, Oh my God, if only I could create this house, this perfect house that I could live in, life would be so good. And I think of that house and I feel good about the house. And I imagine myself moving into the house. I see the, the moving van coming up to it and unloading my stuff and all of these things and me sitting there being happy forever after. That's idol worship. And I need to know that I'm doing it. So the first question is, what are your idols? What captures and commands your attention? Once you figure that out, then it is a matter of constant vigilance. To go, not that. The desire for this house is just attachment. It's, it's literally, it's ignorance. And you, to, to a, a great extent, this is done by main force. 
there's not a lot of sneaky stuff you can do with it. You just have to refuse to worship the idol anymore, to take your energy back from it. So what would be a more healthy relationship to that image of a house? Like, let's say you were in a space where you wanted to work towards something like that. Well, I'm in, I am in a space where I'm working yeah. towards something like that, but I'm not attached to form. So it's not about that specific house. fantasy, yeah. that specific idol. It's more about, in general, this is the goal you've set for yourself. Yeah, having a good house is a, go is a decent goal. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, would I like uh, an adobe on an acre of land uh, just outside of Taos? Yes, more or less. But there's a hundred other houses that would suit me equally as well. So how do you separate honestly and from a place of being connected to the real moving towards that stuff and just kind of being like, whatever it takes, hell or high water, fuck everything. I want this specific thing. Um, there is spiritual inquiry. In this case, it would be a matter of sitting down and asking yourself, what do I really want? And keep asking that and, uh, until you come up with the real answer. So in this case, what do I really want? I want a one-story adobe, uh, New Mexico-style adobe house uh, just outside of a town like Taos with uh, all natural landscaping, not a lawn anywhere on it. Um, and I want a proper Santa Fe fireplace in the corner and all of this stuff. But, and let me tell you, that image is really powerful with me. I can smell what it smells like in there. I can feel the coolness of walking into that house after being out in the hot sun. All of this stuff, it's quite real. But, I almost never pulled that image up because when I asked myself, what do I want? And I eventually came to the answer of, I want a place where I can do my work. That's what I really want. And it doesn't have to look like anything, but you have to keep answer, asking the question until you get the right answer. Mm -hmm. And that opens up a lot more flexibility to see what emerges organically. I mean, you're still taking action towards making those things possible. I mean, we've talked about the Enneagram of process, right? And there yeah. is an amount of will involved, but there's also this surrender factor. Yeah. And the will is towards having a proper place to live and work. Mm -hmm. not having my ideal, what I think of as my ego's ideal place to work. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, in this context, one of my teachers uh, has explained this phenomena. So there are three things we want. Uh, one is need, one is comfort, and one is luxury. So if we can take if we can keep, keep need and comfort within our purview and we can avoid luxury, then a lot of energy can be saved. Because if I want the best of the house, then I need to put so many and so much energy into that. And then how much energy will be left with me for the real spiritual work? So if we can avoid luxury and limit it to need and comfort, then that would be fine. Yeah. I like and who knows, you might even get some luxury, but. Uh, but you're not, not obsessed with the luxury now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. No. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Sheree. Yeah, we actually had the dream home that Ken built mm -hmm. and his blood, sweat and tears went into it. But because of the GFC, it um, 
meant that we had to sell that house in the end. And Ken didn't want to tell me at all that this was a, the possibility of, of our life, that the thing that we built, that the thing that we had cared for and made a beautiful Japanese garden, all the things that you can think of, it was lovely. And I had to look at him and truthfully tell him it was okay. It was okay because I said, we have to learn to make home wherever we are, whether we own it or not, it doesn't matter. Wherever we are, we'll make home. Mm -hmm. And that was the question, what do you want? We want a home. Whether we own it or not, doesn't matter. But to let go of that, that was incredibly hard, but it was incredibly hard for him because he built it. And I think that's hard for people when you build your idol and you've invested so much into it, it is extremely hard that when you're working in relationship, looking at that person, what is the most compassionate action I could take was not to make him feel worse and you know, you've made terrible financial decisions and it's your fault this and the blame game goes on. This is what people divorce over. And, and I thought, no, that's, there's something bigger here and I have to wake up to that fact. What is the lesson I'm being given, which is a blessing because in the end I said, you know what we've just done? We've liberated ourselves from being enslaved to a property. We've liberated ourselves. We're free to do so many different things because we're no longer worrying about this house. Yeah, you know, we won't be able to have that security thing that people talk about. But is it that really that secure? You could have an earthquake and the whole thing could fall down. We have a bushfire. We had the massive bushfires here in Sydney that, or New South Wales, that wiped out a million hectares. I mean, you can't. I think that's the, the difficulty is we think that our idol is permanent. Oh, yeah. Permanent that makes it's, it so uh, hard to let it go. And also the sunk cost fallacy. I've invested so much. I can't let this go now. <laughs> 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 what am I doing with my life if I let this go? And it's like you could open yourself up to so much more life if you let it go. Yeah. yeah, I guess for relationships, sometimes we stay in relationships where we, we put so much time and effort. And if you're looking at it for real, mm -hmm. you're not compatible in a good way. There's no capacity to actually grow and it's abusive. You need to go, you know, so that's a hard, not another hard one, you know, mm -hmm. or, or friendships, toxic friendships. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And when it comes to a relationship, you cannot change your partner Ooh. as much as you would like to. You cannot change your partner. If you got into a relationship with somebody thinking, oh, I can fix them, yeah. you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. What you get is what you got. And if you're not happy with that, you shouldn't have been in the relationship in the first place. There is no fixing. So, yeah. Oh, sorry. yeah, Jonathan. No, go right ahead, Jonathan. Yeah. So you said the first thing to do is identify. Yes. The um, the idol. Then, to me, it seems that a good way of approaching it is to see the addictiveness of it oh yes oh, yeah. that and, is exactly the way to approach it and then how am i going to get off of this addiction am i going to go cold turkey or, or or slow taper if i apply this to my entertainment analogy if i'm 12 hours in front of the screen I'm addicted to screens and all the entertainments that I'm receiving from the screens. What I really want is a genuine interaction with another human. I know that's going to feed me and satisfy me 
more than any screen can. But I've got to give up some of those hours in front yeah. of the screen to allow me the energy and to force me to, to seek this alternative. So here's, a, here's something that I learned a long time ago from, I mean, my first job was as a alcohol detox counselor. Uh, and I have worked with addicts of every sort during the time that I was uh, you know, working on my degrees. And the one thing I know is that there is no tapering off. If you don't go cold turkey, you never break the addiction. A uh, unpleasant fact for people. Here's the thing, and I think you actually touched on it without mentioning it, it, Jonathan. When you are worshiping your idol, you are sacrificing your energy to it. And you need that energy. Take that 12 hours that you sit in front of the screen. If you took the energy that you spend doing that and put it towards something else, uh, it could change your life. And so that's part of what you have to do. You have to withdraw your attention from the idol. You have to refuse to make sacrifices to the idol. Bearing in mind that what the idol wants is your energy because its only life is the life that you give it. If you take away the energy that holds that idol together in your mind, it goes away. It's just not there anymore. And it's interesting when that happens. Uh, going back to my example of the, the little 13-year-old girl I had a crush on when I was yeah. but a kid, I think of her now, and I barely remember her at that age. I remember her uh, when we were in college together and hanging out and things like that, when my crush on her was completely over. Uh, and all of that energy that I used to spend trying to bring that crush to reality, I had for other things. So instead of having an idol, which, I mean, I know people who are still obsessed with that girl or that boy after God, how long ago was that? 60 years? Just about 60 years, yeah. Uh, just can't let it go, huh? Yeah, they just can't let it go. And it's not even letting them go. It's letting it go because the yeah. it is, is the idol that has their face, you know. And it's, I think, yeah, sorry, go for it. Chris. It says the false idol is a double entendre. Yes. Say more about that. I'm just curious what, what's coming to your mind. That's something from the Department of Redundancy Department. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's an ATM machine. Yeah. There are no true idols. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
So that's, that's what we have to talk about tonight. The idea of we all have our idols and it would be wonderful if we began to take our sacrifices back from them and use that energy to uh, address the real rather than the idols. And that's what I got to say about this tonight. Yay, Chris is giving us applause yeah. and huzzahs. Well, and we're giving him <laughs> applause because he's actually here. We haven't yeah. seen him in the longest time. We so, feel neglected. I just want to visit in with people who have not had the opportunity to speak yet. Um, yeah, go for it. Yeah, David, what have you been thinking about? I have been thinking of my idols. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Any you feel comfortable sharing? No pressure, though. Uh, the past is a big idol. Ooh. Mm. Yeah. That certainly can be a big one. Yes. Care to say how that manifests for you? No requirement to do so, but I'm curious. Uh, I think I'm still figuring it out, but... Okay. I have a specific example in mind that I'm probably not going to share. That's fine. okay. No yeah. pressure. But that's a start, you know, and I'm sure you're onto something juicy. So yeah, if you figure it out, tell us later. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> Thanks, David. Levita, how about you? What have you been thinking about? I am fluctuating between I got nothing and I'm in this picture and I don't like it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. I can't think of anyone I know who isn't, you know. So you're not alone in that. True. Mm -hmm. Still don't like it. You don't have to like it. That's okay. I mean, I don't like realizing that those years I spent you know, being so enamored with this person was me being enamored with my objectification of them. That makes me sad. But sometimes we learn these things the hard slash slow way. <laughs> well, you're still ahead of the person who never realized it at all. Mm, well, there's certainly that, but I, I hope we can all learn this lesson and ideally learn it in the way that's most accessible for us. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Levita. How about you, uh, Zaina? Most of this stuff was pointed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the last point where the energy just flies away is quite um, touching me these days as like, wait a minute, what happened? It's like, mm -hmm. where did the energy went to? And then coming back to it. You can rescue it, yes. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's a sign, like, what happened? in that 24 hours was where, where did it go uh, and then you can see see that ah oh, this not safe we have a crappy connection Zainab I think she just lost her image yeah unfortunately but I, I know what she's, I think I know what she's getting at. And yeah, I think we can all think of things we've sacrificed a lot of energy to, and it can be painful to realize that. But as Mushtaq said, you know, we can take back and our no sacrifices. Oh, she popped in and then disappeared. Must be having connectivity issues yeah she's she tends to have a crappy connection do you want to speak without your video on Dana? i think so that's better but um yeah. i was yeah i i pointed out i think the last word so nothing to add 
Okay, thanks, yeah. thanks. All right, anybody else wanna chime in? I think we got a chance to hear from just about everybody. Everybody, yeah. Yeah. Oh, all yeah. right then, yeah. Then it's time to wrap it up for the evening. Mm -hmm. Let's go on Brady Bunch mode. All right, go into Brady Bunch mode in five, four, three, two, one. And all here right. we are. Yep. So I guess we can wave to everyone who's watching on YouTube and to each other, of course. Thanks, yeah. for, Thanks for coming, guys. It has been, as always, wonderful having you in these talks. Without you, there would be no talks. Mm -hmm. So thanks for being here. And uh, if you get more ideas on this, it, we can talk about it in the forum. Yeah. It would be fun. Mm -hmm. All right. Take care. All right. So goodbye, everyone.